We're going to learn a little bit more about the population mean today, but we will interpret a confidence interval and a t uh, confidence level. So good review there. And then we'll do those two review questions that are left from that lecture review at the end. Do you have a question or comment before we turn to our one and only clicker question at the beginning? Question or comment at all? How many of you have made use of the captured lectures? Just curious that you've watched any part of them. How many of you watched the review that we captured again? We're able to find it OK. All right. Just to see that it is being used and that we aren't doing that for <coughs> no reason. All right, one clicker question. Again, another one of those parameter questions. What parameter are we learning about now? We've been working through page 107, 108, 109. Big difference between parameter and, what's the other thing? <laughs> Statistic. <laughs> Which one of these is the parameter? <laughs> All right. We're going to call it. I would like to see a little better. Parameter goes with population. Parameter is anything you would compute on the entire population. What is this guy right there? X bar, that is your sample mean. What is mu? The population mean. What is the one parameter that you could either make a confidence interval for me tonight, or you might test some theory about its value? What parameter tonight? <coughs> what will you write in your H naught and your HA? P. Not P hat. P hat is your statistic that has a model behind it to describe how it tends to vary from one sample to the next. We use that approximate normal model to be able to do the confidence interval with a Z star there, to be able to hopefully do a large sample Z test for a proportion. We'll do one of those for the review question at the end today. Likewise, the true mean, mu, the population mean, which you've seen that symbol before. That's the mean if you had a model to describe the values that are possible. That's the symbol you would use along with maybe E, capital E of X, for the expected value the mean or expected value for the population of values, maybe coming from the model that describes it, or maybe just found by knowing all the values in the population. But most of the time, that value of mu, unless you have a already stated model, is not known and wants to be learned about by either estimating its value or testing some theory. And for that, we go to the population and we again take what kind of sample? What is the minimum, one of the minimum requirements or conditions tonight? Your sample needs to be a? random sample in order to make a confidence interval, in order to do a test. And if we take a random sample out, it's that random sampling that gives us the results about X bar. It's sampling distribution. And we learned those results on page 109. Let's take a look at those again. The parameter is mu, the statistic is X bar. And on page 109, we had these results to tell us how a sample mean tends to vary. These results are found on the front page of your yellow card. You will not need to reference them or use them tonight. You won't even need to use this set for your homework four. It'll be homework five going up next week. But we learned two main results for the sample mean. We called one of them the exact result 
It required a little bit more about your population or your response for that population. You had to assume that the model for your response was normal to begin with in the original population of all people or all patients or all parts. And then if you took a sample and talked about what values the sample mean could take on, it would have this exact normal model, normally distributed for values of x-bar, x-bar values that you could get if you were to sample over and over would be approximately normal or exactly normal, centered at the true mean, and then we quantified how they tend to vary, and that standard deviation for a sample mean was the original standard deviation over the square root of n. Sample means tend to vary around the true mean. They vary even closer to the true mean if your sample size is larger and larger. And the shape or model for how they vary is this normal model. We got this exact result which required a normal model to begin with for your response, but it works for even samples of only 5 or 15 or 150. It works for any sample size. Maybe we'll add that again here. Any sample size at the end this result would work. It requires a little bit more about the distribution of your variable being known to be normal, but it works then for any sample size. So for doing a confidence interval or a test about means, we're not going to require the sample size be large, like we have to for doing the z-tests and z-interval for proportions. And then we have this other result. It's called the CLT, which gives us the same model, but approximately. But what it relaxes is it says that the original model of scores or reaction times or hardness of your parts, whatever that model is, it doesn't have to be a normal model. It can be any distribution at all. But if you take a large enough sample size, your average, your sample mean, will still vary with that bell curve pattern. So we still get to the normal result that we end up needing to do our confidence interval in our test. One of two ways. All right. The standard deviation is what we're going to focus here. We did the ACT scores. That was where we had a normal model to begin with. We did the uniform on the next page where we didn't have a normal model and we relied on the CLT, answered a couple true false questions. Now we're going to take a little better look at this standard deviation. Here is yet another place where that interpretation of a standard deviation is given for you. You can kind of just interchange these basic parts. A standard deviation is approximately the average distance of the possible values. Here we just had to insert x-bar values because it's the standard deviation of x-bar. Average distance of those possible x-bar values from their mean, whatever that quantity's mean is, which is mu here, the true mean mu. So this is a nice quantity to know. And in the ACT score example, we were able to compute that because we were told the model for ACT scores is normal. We were given the mean and the standard deviation. If we can't compute that quantity because we don't know the true value of sigma, we can still estimate it, just as we did for proportions. Our standard deviation for a proportion, p hat, looked like this. Right? Don't you have that expression that you've worked with? That's the true standard deviation. What happened when we put in the hats over it instead? <coughs> it became the standard error of your estimate. And we have the same idea here. We don't know sigma, perhaps. We just have only our sample. You calculate the sample mean, but you could also calculate the sample standard deviation. And that sample standard deviation is represented by S. Put in the sample standard deviation instead of the true value. And now you've got an estimate of that approximate distance. Now I have an idea, an estimate of how far away the sample means might be from the true mean mu in terms of an average distance. This is something I can compute and this is what we'll end up using in our confidence interval, plus or minus a few standard errors. This is what we'll end up using in our denominator of our statistic <coughs> that we compute. So there's the standard error. Now, what we're going to hope to do is calculate some kind of standardized quantity to get our test statistic. And you have calculated z's quite a few times. Every z statistic always takes whatever the observation is, 
minus the mean, and you divide by the standard deviation for that observation. You have calculated quite a few z-scores. On your homeworks, one through three, somewhere you might have calculated just a basic z-score. You did that for the ACT scores with me last time. You just standardized the 21 with the mean and standard deviation for an individual score. You have calculated a z-score that looks like this. This starts to look like what kind of quantity? That looks sort of like a z-test statistic, except that we would have subtracted p naught or divided by the true p naught, 1 minus p naught over n. But we've calculated that it's kind of z-score. And we would like to do the same thing here for means. Now, when we take our sample mean and standardize it, we have to know the true mean. We don't. But under an H naught, we're going to hypothesize that the true mean is some number. So we'll be able to put it in there. And then, just like we did over here in the z-test, we had a hypothesized value. Then we'd like to put the standard deviation down below so we can call it a z, but I don't know sigma. When we did it for proportions, we were OK. If we put in P naught, the true proportion under H naught, we did have the true standard deviation. We could call that a Z. But I'm not going to be able to put in sigma here. That's my dilemma. I can't put in the true standard deviation in the bottom. Sigma is unknown. But we just talked about replacing sigma with your S. And if you do that, and now look at this new standardized type of quantity, the bottom is going to have more variability than what it should have because the S is going to change from sample to sample too. And with that extra variability in the bottom, we get a different kind of standardized quantity. We can't use a standard normal anymore. We have to use a variation of that to be able to have as its model. So let's take a look. If we replace sigma with S, this isn't going to follow a standard normal anymore because that's extra variability here down in the bottom. A little bit of extra variation from sample to sample. So it's going to make these kinds of quantities vary a little bit more, a little possibility of more variability, more out in the tails. And what it's going to have for a model then is called a T distribution. <coughs> And T distributions are a whole family of them. T distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Sometimes that's abbreviated T with the degrees of freedom inside. Just like we have a normal with the mean and standard deviation inside the parentheses, Here's the compact notation for such a curve, a T distribution. Now, n minus 1, do you remember that kind of quantity from before? When you calculated the S, your very first formula on the formula card, where you had that sample standard deviation, it had that n minus 1 on the bottom. Your S was looking at the distances of the values from the sample mean. And we didn't divide by n, we divided by n minus 1. And back in chapter 2, we talked about that's going to be called the degrees of freedom later because it's associated with that S. It makes it a better estimate by putting n minus 1 down there than just n. It corrects for being off and sort of a bias. So that's where the index for our T distribution comes from. And then you've got a picture of what those T curves look like compared to the standard normal. They don't really look all that different. But can you see that the T curves, see the standard normal is the dashed one, but the T curves are a little thicker. A little bit more variability, a little bit more likely to be possibly out here in the tails compared to the standard normal. And that's due to the S that's on the bottom. And there's different T curves depending on what degrees of freedom you have. So a T distribution is still symmetric, still unimodal, still going to be centered at zero. It's got a little heavier tails, a little push down more in the middle, a little thicker tails than a standard normal would. As you get a larger and larger sample size, and thus your degrees of freedom get bigger and bigger, it becomes really, really close to that standard normal. And that's why we were able to use table A2 already with the infinite row to find your Z stars. Those were from the standard normal. We can still use the same idea that a T statistic, when we calculate it later, if it's about 2 or 3 or 4, that's pretty extreme. 
which is that how we find out how extreme it is, the areas under the curve have to go to a different table to find the areas under a t-curve instead. So we will be working with table A2 and A3. We're going to look at table A2 today, so we'll remind you where to get your z-star values. We'll work through what one t-compens interval. Table A3 is for finding p-values when we do that next week. Then your last section of Chapter 9 <coughs> starts out with that definition of a sampling distribution. Remember the true-false question from last time? You have a sampling distribution of what? Not a parameter, but a statistic. Because it's a statistic that's from your sample, computed from your sample, that would vary if you took another sample. You do that over and over. A parameter doesn't have a distribution. A parameter is a fixed value for your population. Every statistic has a sampling distribution. So far, we've looked at a lot of statistics that end up having a nice bell curve, normal distribution. But not every statistic ends up following a bell curve. And what you get to try out next week in your lab is an applet that generates sampling distributions. You can pick your statistic from many to choose from. You can pick your sample size, make it small or make it large, and see what kind of sampling distribution comes out. A lot of them end up being bell curve. And you will see the CLT in action by one of your activities. But you could pick some of the other statistics and find out that the range or the standard deviation as a statistic doesn't have a normal model. All right, that's chapter 9. We're going to do a little bit of chapter 11, the confidence interval side. I like this first note on page 115. You need to know the difference. You need to know that even tonight. We make a confidence interval, putting that out there as a range of reasonable values for the parameter. For tonight, it's reasonable values for P, values that you would accept for that true proportion. We have talked about being able to write a sentence to interpret what the interval is telling us, that we would estimate with this 95% confidence that true proportion to be somewhere between these two numbers for our population, and then also being able to describe what do you mean by being 95% confident? What does that confidence level mean? It's not probability about your one interval, but it is the rate of how well your process works. And it starts out with that if we were to repeat this process. We do know that out of all those intervals you would get, 95% of those intervals would have the true value, the true population parameter. You just have to adjust what you put in for a parameter there. Tonight should go there what? What parameter should go here in this sentence if you were interpreting the confidence level? It should be population proportion. And on your homework four, it should be the difference between your two population proportions, P1 and P2. And for today, when we go through it, it's going to be our population mean. That's the parameter we're estimating now. All right. The background for the example we're going to look at, some actual data is on a new highway sign that's being created, hoping to be able to read what's on that sign at a reasonable distance before you get to that information that's needed. The design of a highway sign, we want to learn what is the true mean, maximum distance at which you can read the sign. So sign's way back there, can't read it yet. A little closer, can't read it yet. Oh, now I can read it. That's my maximum distance away I could be and still read the sign adequately. So that maximum distance being recorded for people to try to find out what the average maximum distance is. So we're going to take a sample of 16 drivers, measure their distance in feet. That is a quantitative response. We want to learn about the mean. These are all clues that tell us we're in this scenario with the mean and not a proportion like we've been doing before. The parameter of interest is this Greek letter mu. It represents what kind of mean again? Mu is the population mean. If you are asked to define tonight the value P in your hypothesis, you're going to write population proportion and then continue. It's the population mean, maximum distance for reading the sign for all drivers. Whereas my estimate, what I will get from my data, and compute the mean there is not mu, it's going to be x bar, a sample mean. So it is the sample mean 
distance for reading the sign for what group? Not all drivers anymore, but the sample of drivers. Hopefully 16. We'll actually find out we have to take one away. But for the random sample of drivers. The drivers in our sample. But just as we have said for every statistic, we know that the sample mean we get might not equal the true value. We know that if we t were to take another sample, get another value for x bar, it would tend to vary. And we've learned that it's going to vary around the truth with a certain amount of variability that we can quantify. Those are the two results. We're going to summarize again on page 116. If you have a sample mean for a random sample, I'm even going to add in here of any size n, but from a normal model. So if the response that we're measuring, if our maximum distances follow a normal curve, we'll be able to use this result for x bar and not worry if we have a large or small sample size. Because we'll be able to say that our sample mean x bar is going to be normally distributed around the truth and that new standard deviation for a sample mean was sigma over the square root of n. The central limit theorem, which we might have to use as a safety net sometimes, because we might look at our data and graph it and find out, oh, normality doesn't look reasonable. Well, then can we possibly still get to where we need to go for this normal model through the central limit theorem? If we calculate a sample mean, and it is still from a random sample, and our model is any model, so it's not necessarily normal. <coughs> but you take a large enough sample size. And you remember what we established here so far is what's going to be large enough? Right around that 25, 25 to 30. Your textbook says 30. Your applet next week, you'll set 25. You'll draw a crazy distribution, whatever one you want to draw. It's not normal, and you'll see it work. So, n of 25 or larger is going to be acceptable. And then we will still get, as our sampling distribution, not exactly anymore, but approximately this normal result. So the conditions that we're going to require are a random sample for sure. And we're going to require that the model for our response is normal, so we'll be able to get to it via number one. But we'll be able to relax that second condition of normality if it doesn't look reasonable, provided n is large. But n being large is not going to be a requirement anymore. Tonight, if you have to write out a condition for doing your z confidence interval or your z test, what are the two conditions? The first one is always that your sample is random sample. And the second one's regarding your sample size, right? You have to check that sort of np and n times 1 minus p condition. That condition's checked with either the right p, if you have it, or it might be checked with p hat, if you're doing a confidence interval, or with a hypothesis test, you have the value of p under h naught. So you put an h naught value, and you check your conditions. All right. Our standard error is what we're going to have to use instead of our standard deviation, because we won't have that value. And here is your nice. Boxed off summary, page 117 at the top, for your next confidence interval for estimating a true mean instead of a true proportion. What do I like about these boxes? Every time you get a new confidence interval defined, the box around it tells you the formula, which is on your formula card, but it tells you what the interval requires. You've had that in previous ones, and we have it here. So I'm going to even box this one off right here. Here are the conditions, the assumptions, two of them in one sentence. The interval requires you have a random sample, that's my RS abbreviation, and it comes from what kind of population? The model for the population is normal. So I think of it as there's one condition on the sample and there's one condition on the population. The sample has to be randomly selected. The population you took your data from, that population has to have a normal model. Then what does it say is a little asterisk. But if the sample size is large, 
and this is the way the textbook has it, we'll still accept 25, but the assumption of normality is not quite as important. Why? Why can this be said? Three letters. What allows me to say, don't worry about normality if you take a large enough sample size, the CLT. So it does not list the sample size being large as a condition, but it's a fallback if the normality part doesn't hold. Let's look at our data. And here are a couple graphs and also that you could be asked about tonight. Because you have made, oops, not yet. That's coming, sorry. <coughs> Data's on the next page. For now, we've got to look up T stars. That's what we have to do next. Table A2. Hopefully you have looked at Table A2. It's on your page 118. And you have pulled out the values that are on the bottom, those infinite values. Do they look familiar? 1.645, 1.96, 2.576. Those are the values for your Z star. Use that tonight if you have to look up a 90 or 99% confidence interval instead of the longer way. But when we do our confidence interval for me, we've got to use the middle part of the table with the degrees of freedom that are appropriate. So let's practice that. If I have 12 observations in my sample, my degrees of freedom are what? Degrees of freedom are n minus 1. How many degrees of freedom? 11. And I want to be 90% confident, so what multiplier would I need to use in this case? So look up on your chart. Use 11 degrees of freedom. And 90% confident, and what do you get? About 1.8. If it were a Z value, you would be all the way down to the bottom at 1.645. But with the extra variability, because you're using the sample standard deviation instead, Got to go out a little further to still be 90% confident. Find the 95% multiplier if you had 30 observations. So 29 degrees of freedom. Under the 95% column, now it's a little more than 2. I'll accept 2 or 1.96 tonight for 95%. But if it's a T star multiplier, if you're doing something for means, homework five and exam two, you're going to have to look up the value, and here it would be 2.05 for 29 degrees of freedom. A little more than two to be 95% confident. Do one more there. You want to look up T star when you had 54 observations. How many degrees of freedom? 53. And you go to your chart and there's no 53. You fall in between. At some point it starts to jump and not give you every single value. If you fall in between, you have to go to the smaller degrees of freedom. Because if you jumped to the larger degrees of freedom, you'd be assuming you had more data than you really did. So by using the smaller degrees of freedom, our multiplier might be a tiny bit larger than it should be, but at least I'll be for sure that 95% confidence, maybe a slight bit more. So we are going to use degrees of freedom of 50 and report what multiplier now instead? 2.01. It's not going to affect your interval that greatly, but I would always want to use the smaller one if I have to read it off the chart. Your computers, when you use SPSS or any other package, it has a table of T values in there for everything. And it will find the exact multiplier for you and use it. But if you're reading it off the chart yourself, use the smaller degrees of freedom. Even if I had 59 degrees of freedom, I'd still go back to 50. What happens is you keep going down with higher degrees of freedom. You finally get to Z stars. because a T-curve will start to look closer and closer to that standard normal. So tonight you'll probably still be drawing some normal curves if you need to for showing your work. <coughs>
But when we do confidence intervals after this or p-values, we might be drawing t-curves. And we'll have to label the curves accordingly as to what they are. All right, now let's look at that data. And here are the 16 drivers, responses. You've got three nice graphs down there to look at, too. We should always look at our data first when it's quantitative in graphs. And good graphs are histograms. Box plots help to identify certain things. And because we need to check for normality for our population, we also made a QQ plot. We are told the sample is supposed to be a random sample, so we still need to check if our model is normal for our population. All right, what do you see when you look at all three graphs? I see one low outlier coming out in the histogram with a little gap, sticking out in the box plot at the bottom there, and also somewhat falling off that line then in the QQ plot. Apart from that outlier, how do things look? Which one really helps to more finely check for normality the best? The QQ plot. Because a histogram, when it's made just with the generic settings, you, know, you change your cut points, it can look a little different. And what you're looking for, do I have any strong departures from normality? Any strong departures? Prominent skewness or distinct outliers? And the only problem we're seeing here is an outlier. But apart from that, it looks quite good, quite good on the QQ plot. I don't see any strong departures from the histogram. It doesn't look bell-shaped and pretty, but it's not showing skewness strongly. And even the box plot looks pretty good apart from that outlier. So how about responses being normally distributed? We definitely would want to say we see a low outlier. Investigating that outlier from our data set a little further finds the following information. That was an observation for one of the people in the study who checked that they usually wear glasses when they're driving, but did not bring them to do the results of the study. So they didn't have their glasses on when they were trying to read the sign from a certain distance. And they had to be further away than, or the, yep, had to be closer to the sign to be able to read it. It was much lower value than what you'd expect for that person. Would that be maybe a reason why we could take that one out, since they hopefully would not be driving without their glasses? So they weren't taking the responses under the conditions that you would expect to see. So our low outlier corresponds to um, someone who forgot their glasses that they normally would use for driving, so they had poor vision. And of course, that influences what we're measuring here. I mean, if we're measuring their blood pressure or something else, it might be fine if they forgot their glasses. But here, that's prominently tied to what we're measuring. So we can exclude it. There's justification. Justified to exclude. <coughs> so apart from that low outlier, Thus, normality seems OK, seems reasonable. We have no problems with that condition being reasonably met. Did I need to have that, too? Did I, do I have the ability to use the CLT here? Central limit theorem requires, we said now, about 25 or more. And we only have 16 and now 15 observations. So that check did need to be performed. So we can proceed. We'll take out, I hope you can find from your data set that 240. Maybe cross that out at the top. That was that lowest value that you can see from your graphs. And then there are your 15 observations, which I know you could get out your calculator. And you could calculate the sample mean by putting those 15 numbers into your computer or calculator. I will give you the value. But you also have your graphs on the previous page to make sure it makes sense. And a sample mean of about 497.3 feet is what you would get. My median looks like it's about 500 from the box plot. Median means aren't always exactly the same, but that's pretty close. I'm also going to give you S. Do you know how S would be computed? <coughs> 
<coughs> now, I don't ever have on an exam, just calculate S. Here are 20 numbers, calculate S, because your calculator can do that for you. The standard deviation is going to take every one of those 15 values and subtract the mean. It's going to look at the distance from the mean. It's actually going to square those distances, divide by that n minus 1 after you add them up, but it's roughly this average distance of the values from the mean. So I'm just going to highlight how it would be found so you remember that. 440 from the mean would be the first contribution, and it would go all the way down to the last one of 490 from the sample mean. It would divide by the sample size 15 minus 1, the degrees of freedom here. And what's under the square root is called what again? The variance. And when you take the square root, you get back to the standard deviation. This give or take, this standard deviation is about 73 feet, 73.4. One of your old exam questions had a histogram, if I remember, and it asked you to pick out the number that could be the standard deviation. Have you seen that one, some of you? And it was a bell curve that looked pretty close to normality, right? The standard deviation represents your average distance. You know if it were a bell curve, you should go at about how many standard deviations each way to get towards the end where most of the observations are in between? About three. So if you went from the middle, of that histogram to the largest value, or smallest, that distance was about 45. And that should be about three standard deviations. So if 45 covers three standard deviations, each standard deviation is about 15, which was the only reasonable value in that list that works. Uh, why is it, it, it skewed that 6895, 99.7 rule does not work. Okay? But still, mm -hmm. The, if there were values there to pick from, there should be two that should be so far out that they can't work. If you have your middle mean and your standard deviation can't be bigger than that distance to the largest value at all, because you're averaging distances. All right, good. 73 feet. So individuals still varied, right? We had values that were up in the 600, all the way down to the 360. How about the standard error? The standard error of X bar. What do you do? You take the 73 feet and divide by the square root of your sample size. And this becomes only about 19 feet. If you took samples of size 1, just one person, their value could vary from the true mean, <coughs> estimate from the true mean, by about 73 feet. If you took a sample of 15 and averaged, averages don't vary from the mean as far away. Only about 19 feet would be the give or take. All right, there's our standard error. You could possibly be asked to interpret such a number. Let's use it to make our confidence interval. And then let's do a nice summary of interpreting the interval and interpreting the level to wrap this up for today. So the confidence interval to estimate a true mean right from the yellow card those formulas are right there. It says to put in the standard error of X bar. So we have most of these quantities already provided for us. The sample mean was 497. I will need you to look up one more T star value for me from your table a page or two back. 15 observations we're using, so our degrees of freedom are 14. And I would like to be 95% confident. So what do you get for that multiplier? 14 degrees of freedom and 95% confident. What? 2.14. And then we did work out the standard error of 19. 2.14 times 19 is about 40. What is the name of that quantity again called? For any confidence interval, that part is played the role of the margin of error. If you are given the margin of error, you don't have to look up the multiplier and calculate that standard error. You already have that full plus or minus part. The standard error is used in the margin of error along with that multiplier. Our interval will go from a lower bound of 350 or 456 
and up to 537. And now we're asked to write a sentence to interpret the interval, write a sentence to interpret the confidence level. Which of those two should use those two numbers right there when you're interpreting the interval? Because that's the interval. We could say, we could start out with our confidence level. With 95% confidence, we estimate. What? What are we estimating here? We're estimating the population mean, mm -hmm. the population mean maximum distance. for all drivers to be what? Between the 456.7 feet and that upper bound. <coughs> this, of course, applies to drivers that are represented by our sample. Drivers who have their adequate distance vision, glasses if needed. There's our interval. In our population of all drivers represented by our sample, we would estimate the population mean maximum distance, for reading that sign, be somewhere between these two numbers. Maybe these would be used then to decide where to put the sign. Maybe they want to make sure it's observed with adequate reaction time, so they might even end up using one or the other endpoints rather than the actual value in the middle. How about interpreting the confidence level? Would it be safer to use these two numbers or not? Not. If you wanted to, you would just start out. This interval, 4.9, 456 to 537, was, was made with a method, and then talk about the method. You can actually interpret the confidence level without saying anything about these actual numbers you just computed, because you're going to talk about the process. <coughs> I know that many of you know that phrase now to begin, if we what? If we repeated. The procedure, the process, many times. Maybe I'll just ask you to describe what you mean by that part of the sentence. What does that mean? Go back to the population of all drivers, take another sample of 15 randomly, calculate the sample mean, the sample standard deviation, get your interval again. So if we're repeating the process many times, that's going to give you what? Not one interval like this one here that we did get, but many. And that's why you talk about the many. You can tell me what you'd expect about those many intervals. We'd expect what? 95% of the, you could even say resulting intervals, To do what? To contain something. Now the something we want and hope is in our interval, well you don't know yet though, but it will be in 95% of the intervals. What is that thing now? The true population mean maximum distance. Not proportion anymore because we're not estimating a proportion. Resulting intervals would contain the population mean maximum distance. Otherwise known here or identified here as being this parameter mu. All right. Another good summary of that. Look at the bottom of your page for just one idea of how exam two is going to be different, maybe more from exam one. A lot more output will be provided in it. Because if the output's provided, you will have the sample mean, x bar, computed for you. The standard deviation, s. And the standard error so that those numbers don't have to be computed. I sometimes give you the data on the exam, but if the summaries are already computed, you don't have to spend the time doing that with your calculator. And then we will worry about this part of the output next week, which is doing a t-test, but do you see the confidence interval? 
take a look at the output that's provided on an exam question. I might be asking you to report the confidence interval, which means it's right down there. Instead of having you have to compute the whole thing from the raw data or from the summary measures even. There it is. Then I might ask you to use it to decide whether a true population mean could be 520 feet. What do you think? Could the true mean mu be 520? Would you accept 520? Yeah, because it's in the interval. Would you accept 480? Any number in your interval is reasonable, acceptable. You would not reject that H naught. All right, there's your graph of the day. You can get out your review questions for the remainder of class. Last two review questions that we did not do on Tuesday. Start with question number three. It's water, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's pot. <laughs> I'll walk over here. <laughs> All right, question number three. Have you looked at it? I see a two-way table, two different variables being recorded, both categorical. Kind of looks like the background of a problem that we did in lecture with the customers being satisfied or not, and whether they received it on time or not. We have a two-way table of the counts, which is one way to present results so that you can calculate some various probabilities. <coughs> so you can help establish whether the political party in any way influences how they're voting or whether they are independent. So you are even given the totals. If they are not there and you do need those totals, maybe you write them in so I can see where you're getting your numbers. Sometimes that can be a source of a small calculation error, but if we see what you thought the total was, you might be given full credit. The first question is a probability. Probability that you randomly select a Democrat that they will be in favor. Probability that if a randomly selected Democrat is polled, they would be in favor. All right, have I randomly selected one of the 100 senators? No, I've randomly selected what? Democrat, that you're given is known. Given I've randomly selected a Democrat, I've used the word given even, knowing that we have a Democrat, I would like to find the probability of them saying in favor. So what would that be? In favor, 27 out of 60. If it had said, what's the probability that a randomly selected senator is in favor? <coughs> then you would look at just the overall in favor count. But this was a randomly selected Democrat that you were given. For part A, this question right here with that ratio of numbers would be given full credit. It is sometimes helpful to identify what you think you calculated so that I can see how you might use it to check for independence. Because depending on what you thought this was, you might be given consistency points on here, but it might be wrong for how you represent it in part A. But you would not, I would not have points attached to it unless I specifically say, show the event. What would be the event, though? What goes inside the parentheses for what you found the probability of? You found the probability of being in favor, given or knowing that they were Democrat. You did find a conditional probability. When you've randomly selected from a subgroup, that's the conditioning part. 
This could have been asked in a couple different ways. Given a Democrat is randomly selected, what's the probability they will vote in favor? <coughs> or among the Democrats, what's the probability of seeing an in favor vote? 27 out of 60 is the right answer. I'd give full credit for that. Of course, sometimes converting to the decimal form will allow you to compare numbers more readily. And this would be what? Point four five. In fact, it asks you in part B to determine whether you have independence between these two events, Democrat and in favor. You should compare this probability we just calculated in part A to another one. We calculated the probability of in favor given Democrat in part A. And we should compare this probability to another one to be able to establish directly if they're independent or not. So you do have probability results on your yellow card. And one of them, actually a couple places it says four independent events. Here's what you have. I need the one that has the conditional version of it under the conditional probability for independent events. I'm going to write this a little bit on the side over here. Probability of A given B should be equal to the probability of A. That's the version of the definition of independence I'm going to be using here. And I've got the probability of in favor given Democrat, so what should I compare that to? Just the probability of in favor. You would compare your answer to part eight with another probability. What is that probability? The probability of being in favor, which is how much? Total in favor, 40 out of 100, 40%. Now, there are other definitions of independence. And if you were just asked to establish, are these two events independent, you could use any one of those you wish. You can use the multiplication rule for independence, where you just multiply the and probabilities and see if they are holding. But the conditional one was what you already found. You would specifically compare it to this rate right here for establishing independence. All right, it's 40% for this one. It was 45% in part A. So what do we determine? Democrat and being in favor are dependent. The relationship of being the same on either side where the conditional part doesn't matter or affect the rate is what happens when they're independent. All right. There is some relationship. There is some influence of being a Democrat to be more likely to be in favor for this particular issue. You could establish if it's a significant relationship later when we teach you how to do that test later on in the class. But for now, we have a strict definition, and those two probabilities are supposed to be the same if they are independent. All right. Would you be able to find other probabilities, too? Would you be able to find the probability that a randomly selected sem senator is opposed and Republican? Could you find that probability? Opposed and Republican. So do I need to use a fancy rule, or is it right in the table? The ands. The answer are those counts that are right in the middle of the table. This 17 right here is the number of people who are in the intersection of Republican and opposed in the end. What would I do? 17 out of 100. You don't need to do some other rule that says to take a conditional one and then multiply by the, the given. That'll just kind of be circular. The ands are right in the middle of the chart. The conditionals are always a particular column or a particular row as a fraction. The ors, you would add up the two and then make sure if there was an overlap, you subtract it off. All right, question number four is a testing problem. Looking at the rate of first year undergrads that are satisfied with that experience, that are happy. Survey of 500 undergraduates, see a large sample size. They were asked to report if they're satisfied or happy, and 58% said yes, they are. But that was down from a 63% that was established about five years ago as being the rate. Is the result we're seeing today, based on our survey, sufficient to support that this rate has come down? 
is the question. We're asked to use a 5% level significance, so I already have identified my level alpha that I'll compare my p-value to. I have a sample size here of how many? 500. Does that look like it's going to be large enough? Yeah. And I could be formally asked to check that condition, but at least it's indicating that it's probably fine. I have a 58%. That 0.58 or 58%, what symbol would I use to represent that number, that rate? 500 undergraduates were surveyed. 58% of those surveyed <laughs> reported they were happy. So that is P or P hat? P hat. It gives me all the information from my sample and, of course, in here, the theory that I want to test. That theory is going to be about a parameter. Part of the definition of that parameter is given, but it's not complete. It's missing a part to make it complete. P is the population proportion of all first-year college students. That what? What are we counting? Who were satisfied? who were satisfied with their first year college experience. <coughs> so in other words, when I harp on P has to be the population proportion, that's not enough. You do have to say and complete the rest of that statement. <coughs> it's the population proportion of all, whatever they were, who did what, and make sure you work out what it was you're counting. That is your parameter. Can you say your theories about that parameter? What will H0 and HA look like? Now I know if this were an exam question, I would see in some places for some students P hat in there, but that would be wrong. We aren't testing theories about P hat, we're testing theories about the true proportion P. I would see in some write-ups 58% up there, but that's not right either because that's the survey result, and I don't even need to know those results to state the hypotheses. You should ignore what the sample is giving you, even though they gave you that summary up front, because you don't need that to write out your theories. What should go in both places? P, the population proportion. Where should the equal sign go? H0. H0 is the statement of what was the status quo, the prevailing viewpoint. And five years ago, that established rate of P, that population proportion who were satisfied, was what level? 63%. And we would like to use the data we just gathered to test the theory of whether it has come down. I will see some put the equal sign in both, H0 and HA. And then I'll ask how that's not disjoint. You have to have them separate. The equal only is an H naught. It's a one-sided test to the left. Now here's how we do sometimes on exams. I don't always have you do all five steps for every test that I give out there and all you know, confidence interval calculations. Sometimes you're given part that's done. Here you are asked to state the theories and identify the parameter, but I gave you the Z statistic. And I didn't ask you to check the conditions. I would tell you that they were met. The Z statistic was negative 2.32. Does that make sense that it's negative? Yeah? Because how was it found? 0.58 P hat minus P naught and then the 63 on the bottom. Now I'm not asking you to verify this, but it does make sense that it's a negative value because the rate did come down in the sample. It was below. Could you for the work here, draw me a nice picture of the p-value. Wouldn't have to be there for the work if I don't ask for it, but if I asked you to draw the p-value, what would you draw? P-value is the probability of getting what you got for your test statistic, or something more extreme, under H0. Draw the H0 model for your test statistic. My test statistic was a Z. My null H0 model, the correct model for a Z, if H0 is true, is that standard normal. So there's your model under H0. Now put on there what you got, negative 
and then show me what corresponds to the p-value, the probability of getting what you got or something more extreme. As extreme or more extreme. That's why in the binomial, if we're doing a binomial here, you still have to include the value and more extreme. As extreme or more extreme, which way should I shade? Left or right? Now, if your exam had HA wrong and you wrote greater than, I would expect you in this question here to shade to the right. And if you get greater than in the first part wrong, minus one point, minus two points, <coughs> but then you do the p-value correctly with your HA, I'm not going to take points off. And then if you make the right decision with your p-value, I won't take points off. But if you were to answer part C this way, which contradicts what you said in HA you were going to test, you'll get points off here, even though this is the right answer by the answer key. Is that an easy number to look up? Yep. Where do you find it? Table A1. Hey, guys, give me about another minute or two, please. So those who want to hear can. It's just 11.15. We'll get done early. All right. Table A1. I get students asking, how do I know when to do 1 minus? If you draw the picture, you'll know. Table A1, area to the left, would be how much? About 0, 1, 0, 2. Showing me the picture will help me see you're doing it right. You read the table and you're off by one row. I'll know that by showing me a little bit more detail. Universal rule. Maybe you'll write it on the cover page of your exam. If your p-value is small, you reject the null, and you are statistically significant. What will be our decision here? If our p-value is this small compared to our 5% level alpha, we would reject the null. We are statistically significant. So what do we circle to complete the conclusion? The is. Good luck tonight.